Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sophie and I am here to present to you Herstory Weekly, a weekly look at women, trans, and non-binary individuals from history that you should know about, but probably don't. At Herstory Weekly, we know that the absences of women from history are not organic, but are made, and we are trying to address that. This week, uh, we're going to look at Hannah Arendt, a German-Jewish philosopher, writer, and political theorist. You've probably seen some quotes from her most famous work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, floating around the internet lately in response to the uptick in fascism in America and Europe. However, philosophy tends to be an anonymizing medium, particularly for female philosophers, and so you probably don't know too much about the woman behind the quotes. So let's change that. Hannah was born in what is now Hanover, Germany, on the 14th of October in 1906. Hannah's family was part of the German-Jewish bourgeoisie, something which was possible only if they completely assimilated and hid all outward expressions of Jewishness. Throughout her young life, Hannah would have a complex relationship to Jewishness. She was cognizant that, as an ambitious young woman, she would be required to assimilate, but as she grew older, grew more annoyed and began to define her own Jewishness in conflict with anti-Semitism. So she, she studied philosophy at the University of Marburg as a young woman, under the direct supervision of Martin Heidegger. Now, if you know anything about history or philosophy, right now you're probably asking two questions. One, that Martin Heidegger? And two, hang on, isn't that Martin Heidegger a Nazi? The answer to those questions is yes and hell yes. So Martin Heidegger was Hannah Arendt's direct supervisor. He was about two decades her senior. Uh, and treated her with a combination of admiration, amusement, and contempt. Arendt and Heidegger's affair is something that would actually follow Hannah throughout the rest of her life. Uh, ironically, Arendt often takes the brunt of the criticism for aforementioned relationship when looking at it from modern eyes, it's kind of hard not to see it as anything other than as a, a man in a position of authority taking advantage of a beautiful young student which is, as we all know, a super gross tale that's as old as time. So, as I mentioned, their affair was very rocky. Uh, and at one point, Heidegger wrote in a letter to Hannah that she should, quote, take a decisive step back from the path towards the terrible solitude of academic research, which only man can endure, uh, and to concentrate on becoming, quote, a woman who can bring happiness and who gives nothing but happiness. Heidegger, revolutionary philosopher, prick, actual, literal Nazi. So they break up, and in the fallout of their breakup, Hannah changes universities and ultimately completes her dissertation on the subject of love in St. Augustine uh, at the University of Heidelberg. In 1932, Hannah hears to the grapevine that Heidegger has begun speaking at Nazi rallies, and she writes him begging that he deny the rumor. He refuses to deny the rumor because it was true, uh, and in response only says that his feelings for her were unchanged. Heidegger, revolutionary philosopher, prick, actual literal Nazi. So because Han is Jewish and it is 1932 and we are currently in Germany, friends, Hannah ha experiences a great deal of difficulty obtaining a professorship. Instead, she begins to do independent research into anti-Semitism and the roots of hatred. This doesn't go over super well, uh, and in 1933 she is imprisoned by the Gestapo briefly uh, and tortured. So, in 1933, Hannah and her family can see the which way the wind is blowing, and she leaves Germany, first for Czechoslovakia, and then for Geneva, where she briefly worked for the League of Nations. Uh, from there, she goes to Paris, uh, where she is involved in helping German-Jewish refugees flee Germany. When France is occupied during the war, the Vichy collaborationist regime provides Hannah's name, along with those of hundreds of others of Jews, to the invading German army. She and hundreds of others are sent to an internment camp, Camp Gour, in the south of France. It's important to note that Camp Gour was an internment camp as opposed to a labor or concentration camp. It was still horrible, and people died of infection and illness and all kinds of things. But the idea of, this, of an internment camp is that you will eventually be moved on. 
either, as the unluckier inmates were, to a labor or concentration camp, or, if you were wealthy and had contacts on the outside, to a different country, provided you could provide the relevant paperwork. So Hannah and her family obtain forged American papers. In response, they are allowed to leave to the U.S. So once in America, Hannah becomes the first ever female lecturer at Princeton, writes numerous articles for a German-Jewish newspaper, and begins working on her first major work, The Origins of Totalitarianism. You should read it. It's very good and very salient, and makes a very interesting point regarding the almost symbiotic relationship between the other and a totalitarian regime. The Nazi Germany regime, in Hannah's view, required Jews, ironically, in order to justify their actions. Uh, a very similar point is made in Sartre's uh, Anti-Semite and Jew, uh, and reading both of those works, which were produced during or immediately after the Holocaust, together, I think is a really important way to understand how fascism and hatred are perpetuated at the individual and systemic level. Arendt was also an a Zionist activist for the creation of a shared Jewish-Arab state in the Middle East, uh, a solution that she felt addressed both the need for a Jewish homeland and would prevent a said state from falling to the pitfalls of nationalism, which she so presciently predicted would befall the state of Israel. She also, like many German Jews of her time, looked down sharply on the Ashkenazi peasantry of Eastern Europe and the Sephardic Jewry of North Africa and the Middle East. Her statements regarding these groups are commonly considered to be both classist and orientalist, uh, and these statements definitely contributed to some of the controversy surrounding her within the Jewish community at the time and currently. Most of the rest comes from having sex with that, like, actual, literal Nazi. In 1961, Hannah heads to Israel to cover the trial of Adolf Eichmann for The New Yorker. The resulting collection of essays describing the trial would be published under the title Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coined the phrase the banality of evil. The central thesis of this text was that evil is often the result of the tendency to follow orders without question, to pursue calm and order above all else, and the tendency of people to follow mass opinion without examining said beliefs critically. She also sharply criticized the conduct of the trial itself, and as a result was herself criticized by many leaders in the Jewish community. As a result of this controversy, neither Eichmann in Jerusalem nor any of her other works will be translated into Hebrew until 1999. I want to finish by noting that Eichmann was a prolific philosopher who wrote a lot of things about political and civil rights in the 20th century, much of which has not aged well. There are very important critiques to be made of the anti-Black racism, Orientalism, and classism that permeates much of Arendt's later writings. Uh, I think that these critiques are incredibly important and could be a subject of their own video. If you want to learn more, I heartily recommend Catherine Gein's book, Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question. If you want to learn more, I heartily recommend Catherine Gein's book, Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question. It addresses and critically analyzes the strains of anti-Black racism in Arendt's writings without denying the important contributions she made to political philosophy. I've also linked below to an editorial in the Jerusalem Post provocatively entitled Hannah Arendt, White Supremacist. Whilst I think that title might be a bit provocative, I do think it's important to recognize and critically analyze the strains of classism and anti-Black racism in Arendt's later works. Arendt died in New York on the 4th of December, 1975, of a heart attack. She was 69 years old and was reportedly in the middle of entertaining a party at the time of her death. Next week on Her Story Weekly, we will be covering the story of Velma Valeria, the first Asian American woman to hold office in Washington State, the first Filipino American to be elected to public office in the United States, and an outspoken labor rights advocate and campaigner. I'm going to finish with the closing paragraph of Eichmann in Jerusalem, which has been on my mind a lot late lately as I see the debate online rage over whether or not you are allowed to punch a Nazi. Um, here it is. Just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and should not inhabit the world, we find that no one, that is, 
no member of the human race can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason, and the only reason, why you must hang.